Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crowley. I'm back with another how to draw video. Today we're going to be learning how to draw glass, basically. Take an object and make it look as if it is made of glass. Now, I'm not really teaching about how to draw this particular bottle, that's why I just put it in place to begin with. I really want to focus more on general principles that you could apply to any object. Um, and so let's go ahead and get into it. One funny thing that I'm going to do with this video, switch from my Dixon Ticonderoga to a completely different pencil. <gasps> Shocking! Stand back everyone, this is the Fantasia Sketching Premium Pencil. I don't even know the company, <laughs> but the reason I'm switching is that th this is a harder lead and um, I, uh, I want the, the shading to be quite subtle in this illustration and I find that the harder the lead is um, the more you can go light to begin with and then gradually um, build towards darkness. So what I'm doing here, uh, and I'm going to start in real time, but again I'll warn you there's going to be, um, you know, time lapse aplenty uh, in this video just because I, I'm going to go for a, a sort of photorealistic um, approach, which is of course very time consuming. But the first principle of drawing, making something look as if it's a, a made of glass, is to try to get some areas of darkness near the top uh, of the object, which seems kind of funny, but I think what's happening is uh, some of the shadow that you're eventually going to see on the um, you know tabletop or whatever down here is getting picked up, reflected um, off of the the top of the object, and so uh, you are going to end up with some dark areas. Now what I did to make this a little more interesting was to create a bottle that had a, a sort of um, <clears throat> wavy shape to it, you know, a sort of a pattern on it. And what that does is um, uh, cause little stripes of darkness to appear near the top. Um, it's not super uniform. I think it's going to be more towards the uh, the edges of the object and maybe vanish a little and then start to pick up a little uh, more as we come back over here. But that's sort of um, principle number one. Uh, get some darkness in uh, near the top of the object. So let's go ahead for our first little round of <laughs> time lapse. And um, I'll just go ahead and complete the darkness that we see right here. All right, so I, I completed all of that darkness down around here, and now I'm adding some darkness uh, to the rim uh, of the uh, bottle. And that's another area where um, uh, you get some darkness. I mean, especially if uh, the rest of the room is dark, you know, this is probably reflecting uh, darkness from other areas uh, of the room in which was photographed. Um, it's a little tricky to give a generalized lesson on making uh, an object look as if it's made of glass because different in, light, in different lighting situations, the area of darkness and lightness will appear. Uh, in different uh, parts of the drawing, but I think, you know, generally speaking, uh, these principles hopefully can be applied to a variety of objects. So um, basically what I'm doing is uh, uh, putting most of the darkness on uh, sort of this left uh, edge here, the southwest corner of the rim, and then the northeast a little bit. Now you're going to see me also erasing away sometimes. Uh, stuff that's uh, here in place because um, as a lot of people who you know try to do r realistic or photorealistic drawings will tell you that you don't see lines so much uh, in nature. Uh, very often it's just uh, areas of shade. Uh, so some of this line work that you see here is going to uh, go away. In fact, why don't we do a little of that right now? Hang on a second. So I'm pulling out my eraser and I'm going to actually um, boldly say goodbye to a lot of these lines here. Um, because the truth is, uh, in, in real life, uh, you're, you're not seeing every single contour of the bottle illuminated. Um, the light is hitting it in certain places, in other places... Um, well, I guess the light is always hitting it, but it's not creating areas of darkness or even areas of grayness. Sometimes there's just nothing there at all that you can see. Anyway, so yeah, erasing becomes part of the process. And I'm going to go ahead and erase a little bit here as well. Although, and this will be maybe the next step of it, um, some of these little contours up here uh, are going to require a little bit of darkness. Again, I think it's sort of caching 
uh, reflections of what's in the room. So let's go ahead and maybe just below the rim start to uh, add just a, a few little areas of shade to sort of pick that up. Uh, pick up a little bit of that reflected darkness. As I said, most probably from uh, areas of the room somewhere nearby. All right, so I'm trying my best to do some of the early parts of this in real time. I know a lot of people hate time-lapse, old man time-lapse. They just wish he would go away and stay away. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll be kicking it back into time-lapse <clears throat> in a few more minutes, I'm sure. I think the next thing to do is to move down uh, to this bottom area and uh, start to add some areas of darkness down here. Um, let me go ahead. Uh, what I'll do in real time is sort of delineate where I expect uh, most of this darkness will go. And, and when I say darkness, I probably should say grayness because it's not, it's not really going to be jet black down here. It's more of uh, an area of, uh, of dark gray. But uh, I would say that uh, so along this lower edge around here, I'm just sort of putting a wavy line. This is uh, this is basically where you're going to see me adding um, gray, kind of a darker gray down here, a lighter gray up here. But this area over here is where you will see me not adding any gray. Uh, but I'll save that. Uh, for a later part of the lesson. So let's go ahead and in, uh, in time lapse, I'm going to start adding some areas of gray down here. Okay, so I just wanted to come back in here and explain a little bit um, what my thinking is and some of the choices that I'm making. Uh, it seems to me that this uh, this dark area of the rim here is probably going to um, get reflected or sort of caught uh, down here in the bottom of the uh, the bottle, and that's why I'm putting a sort of a darker area right here that sort of signifies that rim getting reflected down here. Now, as I said, as I get closer uh, to this edge, I'm leaving it largely white. And the reason for that is that in a funny way, just as, you know, the, the top of this clear object ends up with all of this dark stuff, which may be a little counterintuitive, um, uh, in a similar way, it, with light coming down from this direction, uh, the, instead of drawing the light so much here, it gets caught down here on the other side uh, of the object. And then this is where most of the, um, you know, sort of white hot highlights uh, are eventually going to go. So uh, just a couple of little notes there about, you know, the, the decisions that I'm making down here in terms of the shading. I think there's going to, you know, I'll, uh, this will get continued uh, or I will continue adding to this whole area when I get to the uh, the polishing phase uh, towards the end. But maybe this gives us enough uh, for now to start moving on to uh, uh, rendering some of the shadow over here, which is also uh, actually quite an important part of making something look as if it's made of glass. So. Um, Let's go ahead maybe and um, I think what I'll do is shift focus a little bit so that you can uh, really look at the shadow in greater detail. Okay, so generally speaking when you're doing a drop shadow on an ordinary object, the darkest area of the shadow is always really near uh, to the object. And so this is where I'm starting to darken things in. But, you know, when something's made out of glass, you end up a, with a really funky <laughs> light situation. Funky? Is it like dance music on the shadow? Dude, you're not making any sense. No, you end up with these very unusual uh, shadow situations because the light is pouring through and actually, you know, um, illuminating um, parts of the shadow to, to rather dramatic degrees. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm darkening in the edge of the shadow, much as we sort of got darkness at, uh, in the upper uh, areas of the bottle, uh, I'm going to be darkening in the edge of the shadow, but I'm going to be leaving um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of white spaces here on the, uh, on the surface of the table, the sort of like ref refracted light. Is that right? Refracted? Any science people out there? able to tell me? Refracted. Anyway, the light is sort of uh, passing through here and um, 
spilling out uh, in a, you know, I'm going to mix a few lines here to give you a sense of this. I think it starts to sort of fan out uh, across the table in this way. And so down here I'm going to do the, uh, the same kind of a deal. I'm going to be darkening in the edge with a fair amount of confidence. Um, but leaving a lot of uh, white areas. And, and what happens, you know, I'm kind of struggling to try to do this real time because it's uh, a lot of it is uh, quite time consuming, but I'm trying to sort of dash in a lot of this really quickly to, to sort of get to the final effect in real time. But what's going to happen is, uh, especially because this, uh, this has rippled glass, as the light passes through, uh, it's not going to be uniform uh, light on the surface of the table. See these dark uh, areas that I'm putting in here sort of signify the, those ripples. Refracting, I'm just going to own it. Refracting, <laughs> talking as if I really know what I'm talking about. Refracting the light upon the surface of the table. So as to produce this effect, I've run out of big words. Someone help me out here. Anyway, these uh, several um, different areas, I think, kind of account for that uh, ripple effect in the glass. Anyway, um, what happens, though, at the far end of the shadow is it's going to be fairly dark. I think what also there is some light that gets caught up here and then passed onto the shadow. So this is also not going to be jet black. Uh, I mean, all, all the way through, there's going to be some sort of areas in here that are left white. Uh, but, um, yeah, maybe basically that gives you my uh, plan for... Uh, how I'm going to fill in this shadow, like I said, just kind of dashing this in so as to move quickly through it in real time, and then we will tidy this up quite a lot um, when good old good old man time lapse comes along to save me from the boredom of my own voice. Anyway, we uh, I think we've got the basics in place here so that I can do another little time lapse session to uh, get further along. Uh, with the rendering of this shadow. Okay, so this is still pretty sketchy um, for now, and as I said, there is going to be this sort of polishing phase during which I refine uh, a lot of this quite a bit. Quite a bit. Um, but for now, I want to move back to uh, drawing the bottle and um, adding some of the... Um, I would say sort of the secondary areas of gray that you might not um, think to put there the first time. You know, I think what we've got there to begin with are, are the, the big, bold, obvious things. We're going to go for uh, more of the subtleties now as we move back to uh, uh, further rendering the bottle. Okay, so I talked about how um, the darkness of this rim uh, area is maybe getting caught and reflected down here at the bottom. I think it also... Uh, begins to pick up a little bit here in this, uh, oh boy, again, I don't know the word for this little area here. <laughs> the man who never knew the word for anything, uh, and yet tried to teach people <laughs> using words. Anyway, these uh, this sort of black oval line uh, is getting uh, caught here in the neck, right? The neck of the bottle. Could it be as simple as that, the neck of the bottle? I think it is. I think it is. How pathetic that I, that I didn't know the word neck. The neck of the bottle. So anyway, we uh, are getting some lines. And now because I have this sort of pattern in the glass, the, the lines are not straight. You know, they sort of dip up and down and so forth as they uh, get uh, refracted. I'll go ahead and use refracted. Refracted. Uh, in the surface of this glass. I th feel like I'm even goofier than usual today. What is it? Was there something in the coffee this morning? Really? Get a hold of yourself. Um, but yeah, adding in little subtleties like this, uh, I think will really, uh, in the end, make the drawing much more convincing. You know, uh, whenever I do these sort of um, 
photorealist, uh, I guess I should say so-called photorealist, because I don't know if they, <laughs> they really qualify technically, but um, uh, whenever I do these types of illustrations, so much of it depends on the uh, final polishing stage. Uh, the, all the little tiny details that you add in towards the end, they really make or break the drawing. They sort of lift it up to a higher level. Now what I'm doing here is adding just a little bit of, you know, uh, free-floating gray. Uh, and what happens with glass is even though it is, you know, largely colorless, uh, you know, provided you're, you're using clear glass and not some sort of colored glass, um, even though it is largely colorless, uh, you will find that there are areas of gray, um, or very light gray anyway. Uh, and uh, those also are quite crucial later on in terms of um, when you when I come back and start adding highlights using uh, my trusty white gouache. <laughs> Somehow that doesn't roll off the tongue the way trusty, trusty black Prismacolor does. My trusty white gouache later on. Uh, needs something to be seen against, right? It needs there needs to be some grayishness there, um, so that uh, that the white, the really pure white of the gouache, will show up. So you may find uh, it advantageous to get in here and and just sort of gray things up a little bit um, in anticipation of that. But it shouldn't, you know, it's not random. You're, uh, there's some sort of a system to it. Like I'm deciding here that this area is catching some of the white and I want this this to come forward a little bit, so I'm sort of darkening it in. Um, there's method to my madness. I'm uh, not just sort of applying the, the gray um, without a concept behind it. Uh, and in fact, I think that uh, because I got this white, I'm, you know, I'm planning to put a very brilliant white uh, area down here, that this whole upper region will probably benefit from being um, grayed in, grayed up, <laughs> grayed over um, a little bit. Of course, you want to, and that's part of the reason that I'm using a, um, a harder lead, 4H, did I say that? 4H is the uh, hardness of lead that I'm using here, um, is that it allows you to not go too dark too fast. And so that's why uh, I have chosen that. Well, I think it's time maybe for me to start moving into this polishing phase. And, um, rather than try to do that real time, which honestly would put even me to sleep, <laughs> you will see my head coming into frame <laughs> as I draw <laughs> because the polishing phase is so long uh, and the, uh, ad, you know, the, the uh, advancements in the drawing take place so incrementally that it just really is not very interesting to watch. Um, but maybe I'll come back once or twice and, and talk about some of the, um, you know, little decisions that I've made uh, in this uh, so-called polishing phase. So let's go ahead and get into it. All right, well, we're about ready to move on to the um, darker lines. But before we do that, I'm actually going to bring in the eraser and erase away certain areas. As I was saying before, um, when you're doing realism, uh, there are not always lines everywhere. And uh, so part of the key actually is to uh, eliminate really clear lines sometimes uh, so that you see things the way you do in real life. Sometimes with, uh, you know, there's no line between one area and the other and it kind of blurs a little. And uh, if you can, you know, if you're willing to go back in and erase away uh, certain areas, it actually adds uh, an added, it adds an added level of added <laughs> realism. How many times can I use the word added? Hopefully you get the idea in, in, <laughs> in spite of my inability to speak properly. But now it's time to put this uh, uh, Dixon Ticonderoga aside and pull out the black Prismacolor, my uh, pencil of choice for uh, darker line work, and um, I'll do a little bit of this real time, but I'm going in and taking some of these uh, first areas that were um, 
you know, areas of darkness and going to really start to uh, beef them up. And you have to be kind of careful, pick and choose where do you think the darkest uh, stuff goes. As I said, this there's sort of like two areas here on this side and on the um, uh, other side where I think things get their very darkest. Although this area in here I think can also benefit from going jet black to a degree. I'm always, you know, I'm very tentative, especially in this style of drawing, not wanting to go too far because uh, with the black Prismacolor, it, it is more or less impossible to erase once you go really jet black. So, uh, caution is not a bad idea. So I'm just, uh, you know, dropping in little bits of black here and there. I think this area in here in particular is going to benefit from uh, going considerably darker. I think when you're drawing glass, when you're drawing chrome, uh, you know, things made out of metal, uh, it's all about contrast. Uh, getting the dark areas to be really dark, and then later on you'll see with the white gouache the light areas. Super light. Uh, and the more contrast you get, the more that illusion of, uh, in this case, glass is going to come through. So if you've tried to draw glass in the past, and glass in the past, if you have tried to draw glass at certain points and found that it just was you weren't really quite getting that illusion that you wanted to, part of the problem may be that the black areas are not um, black enough and that um, you would benefit from, uh, you know, I like the black Prismacolor, which is a colored pencil, uh, mixing it together with a more standard uh, graphite pencil. But uh, I suppose you can find um, charcoal pencils that'll go jet black. Problem is, is that they smear really easily. So you have to be very disciplined in terms of not allowing your pen, you know, finger to go back on top of that area that you just went in. Well, I think you're kind of getting the idea of how uh, the, you know, the black areas are going to benefit this. I'm going to go ahead and finish off adding all of the black stuff uh, in time lapse, and then we'll uh, come back to to do the white gouache. All right, well, I think I've got most of the darks as dark as I need them to be. It's time to move on to the white highlights. I'm going to refocus the camera, though, because uh, pretty much all of the white highlights are going to come uh, right in here on the bottle. Okay, so I've pulled out my white gouache here, and uh, I'm going to start applying just a few highlights. Now, I always hold off on doing highlights until I'm pretty much done with my illustration. Uh, my thinking is that you don't want the... Uh, you don't want to touch the paint even after it's dry with your fingers because it will um, it won't be as white, right? So I'm adding uh, I'm adding like two or three little white dots. Now, of course, these wouldn't show up if I didn't have the area as um, pretty gray to begin with. So that's kind of key to get down um, a very subtle little layer of gray color before you come in. Uh, trying to do your highlights. And sometimes it is necessary to go back in on top of highlights after you've applied them. Um, and uh, I'm thinking that there will be some secondary area uh, of uh, highlights right here around the uh, neck or maybe up here on the very rim of the glass. You don't want to overdo it with highlights. Um, but uh, certainly there's going to be some over here, right? The light hitting and reflecting off of that far edge. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of commit to a, a few fairly bold highlights right over here. Uh, but one of the cool, interesting places where the highlights tend to really show up and collect is down here on the opposite side of the glass, right? So the light is hitting from here, but it gets kind of caught um, here in the lower right hand side and that's where you can go in with uh, what may seem like a surprisingly large number of these little highlights. But that is really one of the interesting little tricks of what happens with light 
when um, you have a bottle like this. And to me, it's sort of funny, the location, because when you're learning about light and shadow, you're always told, you know, put the highlight over here if the sunlight is coming. But because of glass, it actually is all collecting over on the other side, which is kind of fun to, you sort of feel like you're breaking the rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sticking it to the man. I'm putting the, I'm putting the highlights on the opposite side, man. Freedom. Oh boy, there really was something in the coffee this morning. I'm convinced. I'm gonna ask my wife, honey, what did you put in there? Anyway, I'm getting near to the end of this. Gonna add just a few more little highlights here. Um, maybe just a touch of final polishing. But like I said, but when I uh, move to gouache, that means I'm pretty much done. I don't want my hand to be uh, brushing on top of this page very much uh, after I've reached this stage. But let's go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll take care of those final little bits and then uh, refocus the camera to give you some final words. All right, well, there's my video on how to make something look uh, like it's made of glass, how to glassify something. Let me know what you thought of this video. I could do more uh, videos like it, you know, how to make something uh, look like it's made of wood or, you know, we could turn it into a whole series. Why not? Let me know if you would like to see me do that. But for now, let me thank anyone who has supported me by getting any of my books. We got Miki Falls and Brody's Ghost, the graphic novel series, as well as Mastering Manga 1 and Mastering Manga 2, my instructional how to draw books. This one coming out this month. Many people have ordered it and already received it, so big thanks to you for supporting me there. I'll go ahead and put a direct link uh, for purchase of that right there in the info box. But for now, let me go ahead and lay down this pencil. I want to thank you all for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back with another one real soon.